is the ferry over there. It takes people in cars and bicycles and things all the way across. We're going to start out at Pier 55. Yay! This is where the Red Robin is. Bar and she's got all sorts of things to eat and drink down there at the bar. So if you get hungry or thirsty at any point throughout the trip, definitely go down and uh, visit Amy. Or if you have any questions about anything, feel free to ask her any We're questions that you have. There's but uh, should be a pretty nice uh, cruise this evening. Lots of interesting things to see along the way. So welcome aboard. Just grab yourself something to drink from the bar, sit back, and enjoy the tour. Well, thank you, Captain Steve. Once again, good evening. Welcome aboard the Good Time Three. I'm Kristen, I'll be your either end. Load and unload passengers. Usually they have a magic wheelhouse at either end too. So instead of turning around in Elliott Bay or the Sound, they can just walk to the other wheelhouse. And then they won't have to worry about backing out or things like that. So it makes it very convenient for uh, transporting cars. And the perfect stadium for Seattle. First, it was within our budget, $317 million. Second, even though it is uh, an open-air stadium, 70% of the seating is covered. So it's perfect for the cockpit. This is where the crane operator sits. Just below that hanging from the wires are big clamps. The clamps pick up the containers and unload them from the awaiting dock or from the awaiting barge. So we just had a container ship get loaded up and head out uh, about 100 miles north of here. Uh, so this is kind of a, a cool... below the deck as well. So there are hundreds of containers on these huge awaiting vessels. Now we're kind of all wondering what the elephant in the room is. It actually just showed up here about three weeks ago from Hawaii. And we all had to figure out what it was the same day it showed up. We're like, if everyone's gonna ask about that. We better find out what it is. It's part of a, it's a ballistic missile radar. So it can detect ballistic missiles um, from an obscene amount of weapons. They're not allowed to be more than 100 or closer than 100 yards from the platform and the radar. So they are uh, constantly watching over the radar here at the south end of Elliott Bay. Just behind the Navy boat, there is a big container ship coming in. As you can see, it has those two tugboats kind of guiding it into the slip there. So this is a little bit smaller of the container ships that we would normally see, though in about 90 seconds time, they can unload one of those containers. So it takes between a day and a day and a half to unload a huge container ship like that, rather than months and years. 1914, and it was the tallest building outside of Manhattan until the Space Needle was built in 1962. Kind of an easy way of telling how old our skyline is. Uh, everything taller than the L.C. Smith Tower there was built after 1962. Another building in our skyline is that tall, narrow, black building. This is the Columbia Center Tower. And this is going to remain the tallest building in Seattle. That's because we have a ceiling on our city. The FAA has a highly regulated height restriction and you're not allowed to build anything higher than 1,000 feet tall. So the original design for this building with green letters and white trim around it, this is the Seattle Aquarium. This is up here over and over again if you watched uh, the real world Seattle. To the left of it, there's a grassy area here. There's a big red statue on top of it. This is the Eagle designed by Alexander Calder in 1971. This is an eight and a half acre outdoor park that's part of the Seattle Art Museum. This is the Olympic Sculpture Park. It's open every day from dawn until dusk. So check out the Sculpture Park. It's a nice walk outside of downtown. Just behind it, you can see the Space Needle. This is the official city icon of Seattle. It was built in 1962 for the second World's Fair that Seattle hosted. It's 605 feet tall, and I guarantee you it's the tallest four-story building you will ever see. The bottom floor is kind of a ticket booth, guest services. About halfway up, there's a banquet hall. So if you want to um, science fiction museum and then the EMP. The EMP is my personal favorite. It's the Experience Music Project. 
Do I have any music fans on board? Specifically, Seattle musicians. Jimi Hendrix has some really fantastic memorabilia there. Also, they just opened a Nirvana exhibit. It's just $15 to go to the museum, to go to the exhibit, and then you have the kind of the grounds for the rest of the museum as well. So that's a nice thing to do on an afternoon while you're here in Seattle. Seattle, kind of call it condo hill now because there's just houses, apartments, and condos literally built on top of each other on the hillside. Queen Anne became popular after 1909 when the Seattle streetcar was able to make it to the very, very top of the hill. Uh, before that, people were pretty reluctant to hike about a mile out of town to go up to Queen Anne to live, but they kind of got over that after the streetcar was able to make it to the top, so now it's very popular. This is also where you find the most beautiful, intelligent, talented people in Seattle. That's where I live. And uh, you also have a fictitious character that made it pretty famous. That would be Dr. Fraser Crane, the hit TV series Fraser. Before that, Cheers. He would have technically lived in Queen Anne, though they only filmed one episode of Fraser in Seattle. It was the series finale where he gets mugged in downtown. They eat as much salmon as they possibly can. They're trying to fatten themselves up so that when they go back to California, they can get all the ladies by becoming the beach master. Beach masters are anywhere from 700 to 1,000 pounds in size. That's like three or four grown men put together. That's a lot of, a lot of California sea lion. They make their way up here to yeah. Seattle, feed as much as they can, hang out on these buoys. It's kind of like King of the Hill or King of the Buoy here. So kind of there's your National Geographic. 22 feet tall, the beam of the light couldn't shine very far, but really with an average width of only 4.5 miles, we wouldn't really need it to. So it's kind of common around uh, the Puget Sound area. You'll see a lot of lighthouses. You wouldn't even re really be able to tell they were lighthouses because they're just not very tall. About 226 cloudy days each year, 190 are completely overcast. So that means the sun doesn't break through the clouds for even a single second. It's gray, but it's not gloomy here like everyone might think. There's no like kind of flag with a green marker on it, with a pole with a green marker. It's kind of a best place to go in and out of Shoshone Bay because to your left you would have um, the Lake Washington Ship Canal, which we're on now. And to your right, you could go out and sail, just like all those sailboats we passed on our way in. It has all your typical amenities, uh, fueling dock, grocery store, cable TV, internet ready. You see, just in front of the Shoshone Bay Marina, we have some paddle boarders. Paddle boarding began in Hawaii, and it is quite the workout. If you're planning on renting a paddleboard or participating in this sport, you probably talk to someone that's done it first because you're gonna get tired after not too long at all. Your arms get tired, your legs get tired. Looks like you're paddling on top of a surfboard. Actually, it's a little bit wider than a longboard, so it gives you some balance, but it's pretty tough, especially out here on the sound. You're going against wind, maybe waves, wakes from other boats. And if you fall in, it's really, really cold. So I would recommend paddle boarding. Bay. Shoso is a Native American word for threading. It came after so the implication that we're entering into a very small mouth of this bay. So it's a pretty narrow entrance as we make our way through here. You look on the right hand side, you can see this is the north end of Magnolia. The tide is out quite a bit now. You can boat off every single day, so that's why people lift their boats out of the water. On the left, about six houses in, there's a three three story gray house with a flagpole out front. There's also an or, or, there's also the Statue of Liberty there. So I didn't know if you think you would see the Statue of Liberty here in Seattle, but there are three surrounding our city. So one over in Medina, neighbors with Bill Gates. He has a Statue of Liberty on his roof. And then over in Alki Beach, there's another Statue of Liberty. So not typically you'd, something you'd expect to find here in Seattle. Mm -hmm. 
And you see on the right hand side, there's a brown house there with the car. You don't have to worry about paying to moor your boat. You just park it in the front yard. It's perfect. Hundred uh, ton counterweight that's on the left hand side. Though if it's down, you'll know we can be expecting some train traffic either to or from Seattle. So if it's in the down position, which it is, we'll be expecting to see a train shortly. Uh, let Amy or myself know if we can answer any questions for you. Enjoy. have arrived here at the locks. Directly in front of us is the large lock chamber. The uh, lock master has called us into the small lock chamber, which is off to the right side of this wall sticking out here in front of us with the traffic light, red traffic light in the We're gonna make our way into the small lock chamber. In addition to the two locking chambers, there is also a spillway dam here at the locks directly in front of us, uh, that series of arched structures, water spilling out, that is the spillway dam. We're gonna make our way into the small lock chamber here. Once we get tied up, I'll get back on the microphone and tell you a little bit more about what's going on here at the locks and how they're actually gonna lift us up to the freshwater side on the other side of the locks.
So we're going with our top shelf Crown Royal and hot apple cider for five dollars. Normally a nine dollar beverage. And the other shake this head no. And the other is uh, peppermint schnapps with hot cocoa. There's a lot of chicken stuff in here. Okay, series on the Discovery Channel. If you've never seen the deadliest catch before, or you have no idea what I'm talking about, you probably have been seeing, seeing the uh, celebrity vessels here on the ship canal. We arrange about 10,000 jobs um, in a triangle-shaped roof. Kind of going to be back, going back and forth now for you, just to make it interesting. A vessel. NOAA is the National Oceanic and Water Snake-like little thing. This is to uh, put around vessels when you're doing things like fueling them or any sort of spillage. They want to contain it so that it doesn't get leaked into our fresh water here. Also, this area, this strip on money in Seattle, and you can tell so just by the boats we have. As I mentioned, one in every eight red. We also have an additional 68 thousand millionaires living in the greater Seattle area. That's a lot of millionaires. You didn't mishear me. 68,000 of them. Oh, wow. Now off to our right, there's a two-story. Imagine if you were at home cooking dinner, you wanted to take your dinner party to Lake Washington. Off our right, there's also a little square light blue houseboat there as well. You can see they have a deck built onto the back of their and their front of their house, actually. This is pretty uncommon. Typically, you see people with their lawn chairs on top of their houseboats because there's just not that much room for a, a deck. But I think this must have been an add-on for these folks. It is a huge kind of, I guess you would call it a fixer-upper. It was purchased for $50 million, and it's now currently being renovated and turned into a personal pleasure craft. I actually cannot wait to see what it looks like when it's done. In the very back, the stern of the boat, what looks like a big one, remind me as you step off the boat, Bill Gates' um, helicopter landing pad is parked just next to our docks at Lake Union. So it's called the Holly Manu, it means uh, the ceiling of heaven. So we'll get a chance to see that at the end as well. On the right, there's a black, white, and red vessel. This is called the uh, Fireboat Alki. So just like we have fire trucks, on the ground, we have fire boats in the water as well. Fireboat Alki was moored here in 1927 as the official fireboat for the freshwater. It would answer any distress, emergency, any sort of calls that we had here. In fact, when we were departing earlier, we saw the fireboat Leshai out on the uh, saltwater side of things. Now we're going to be crossing under the Ballard Drawbridge. We have 42 feet of clearance here, so we got plenty of room as we cross under. If you look up, it's kind of made of this green mesh metal. You can actually see the cars going over as we cross under. And it was designed that way in order to have a, a much lighter lift, so it can open the bridges a lot quicker. And here on the ship canal, seeing a how many, and then the bridge would respond in the exact same call if it was okay for us to pass. If it wasn't, they'd sound five blasts, and we'd know we have to stop, turn around, or go back. Whatever it was, it was a no. On the left, this is the Seattle Maritime Academy, this kind of group of vessels here. This is a terrific facility that we have here at the pretty much centrally located on the ship canal. These are going to be your future captains, marine deck technicians, engineers. They offer all of these high-tech sort of advanced courses, all the way down to courses for the recreational boater. So anyone can theoretically take classes at the Maritime Academy here in Seattle. We're really lucky to have them there. It's not uncommon to see captains at Argosy Cruises even uh, drive for two or three days, drive boats, and then they'll go over to the Maritime Academy and teach classes the other few days of the week. So kind of mix it up in the, the marine and land world here at the Maritime Academy. It's not very big, considering if you've seen the deadliest catch, they're battling waves that are 30 to 40 feet high, these huge swells. So they have to be very, very careful. You can see there, but much, much longer. I guess it would provide some sort of balance as far as the, the deck was concerned. You also see these huge lights on top of it. That's because some of the time that they're in Alaska, 
they're going to be fishing in nearly all darkness or they're staying up 24 hours a day of which they'll see only a few hours of sunshine. So they're uh, an important part of the North American as well. There's purse stainers, things like that. on which people think we're going to cross under first. So if anyone has any guesses, you just let me know which one you think we're going to transit first. On the right, this is a cute little houseboat community down this alleyway. See what I was talking about? They put their chairs on top of their, uh, on, uh, but this Foss uh, dry dock right here, there's two vessels lifted high and dry out of the water. You see the wing walls on either side. They fill them up with water, it sinks down all the way until it's submerged. They drive the vessel, in this case two vessels, into the slip, and then they let all the water out, it lifts it high and dry out of the water. So you can see just how much of the vessel is literally lifted out of the water. Those big barges will eventually make their way out the uh, large locks, because the small locks are just a little bit too small, and they'll travel out to the sound or where, head wherever they are going there. So usually there's a huge barge parked in front of the gravel company here. So kind of is a, an indication that it was recently filled up and then sent out and they're waiting for the next one. Now we're gonna be entering a man-made portion of the Lake Washington Ship Canal. This is the Fremont Cut. The cut is just a quarter mile long, about 200 feet wide and about 20 feet deep. It was dredged out in order to create the path from Puget Sound to Lake Union and then eventually Lake Washington. What happened was they lowered the level of Lake Washington by nine feet in order to flood the two man-made portions, the Montlake Cut and the Fremont Cut. So this tour would really not have been possible about a hundred years ago. We would have run into the rolling plains. We would have had to turn back around, head back to Salmon Bay. Uh, but now that we're traveling on the cut, it's going to be a straight shot to Lake Union, which lies at the halfway point of the Lake Washington Ship Canal. And Seattle Pacific has less than uh, 4,000 students and faculty combined. So it's a very tiny school that we have here. It's pretty fantastic, though. Uh, we enjoy having Seattle Pacific located so closely on the cut, it always makes for some good people watching along the ship canal. On the left-hand side, first it was my favorite so building when it was the, the Red Hook Dinosaur. Brewery. It's now it's my favorite so building it because it's home it to Theo Chocolate. It's a chocolate factory that's fair trade and organic chocolate. So they offer some pretty weird flavors. I'll tell you, we have some on board and we tried the spicy chili chocolate earlier pretty good actually they also have peanut butter and jelly coconut curry chai tea toasted salty almond coconut all kinds of funny flavors so theo does tours we fold down our mast and antennas and then we squeeze under the fremont drawbridge by about six inches so it's pretty fantastic so if you're if you're outside you want to uh Go, go outside if you're not already, and we're gonna transit under the Fremont Bridge by just a couple of inches. It's very close when we cross under because it's very, very close. This is the most frequently open drawbridge in the United States, opening on average 35 times per day. The record was 54 times in one day. That's in the Guinness Book of World Records. as we cross under. This is not the right boat to sit on the top of, but that's to say the least. 3,000 uh, feet long. You would expect that probably any vessel could transit under this bridge. Though Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, has a sailboat so tall, it can't even take it home because it won't go under this bridge. The mast is so tall, but really floating homes remain stationary. They don't move from their dock. They literally live on top of the dock here, floating on the water. In the early 1900s, we saw a lot of boat builders, mill, and timber workers looking for a very cheap way to live in Seattle. In fact, this was free. They had these huge cedar logs, which they rolled down the hill. 
Houseboats are anywhere from 80,000 on up to about two or 300,000. So it's not very expensive at all, but you live on a boat. You have to do the regular boat stuff. Your, your house needs in your engine room checks. And on top of it, this is called Gasworks Park. It's one of the point. It lit the streets and homes of Seattle. Uh, and that was until 1962 when Seattle acquired the park. They hired a local architect named Richard Hag to redesign